And we are live. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the PSBPA Technical Solutions Webinar Series. My name is Martha Ellis, and I'm the Executive Director of the Public Safety Broadband Technology Association, or the PSBTA. If you are unfamiliar with our association, our mission is to work as a broadband end user advocate for all first responders and service providers. Today's webinar is also presented by the Public Safety Spectrum Alliance, or the PSSA which is comprised of our nation's foremost subject matter experts on all aspects of broadband allocation, use, and optimization for first responders. It is an honor for both of our organizations to be hosting this discussion with our newly appointed FCC Commissioner, Nathan Symington. Before we get started, I need to cover a few house housekeeping items. All attendees have automatically been muted to reduce background noise. Any questions should be submitted directly to us through the questions function, which is located at the bottom of the menu on the right side of your screen. Questions will be answered at the end of our panel discussion, and we will attempt to answer as many questions as possible and follow up with those that we don't get to during the live portion of this webinar. An email address will also be provided, so if you have additional questions as we conclude today, you can send them to us directly. Today's first responders face a very different world than our predecessors of 25 plus years ago. Our challenges are becoming more complex and compounding. Mutual and automatic aid activations requiring multidiscipline response and oftentimes partnerships with national level resources require a whole new level of interoperability, connectivity, and bandwidth to support successful outcomes. Since 9-11, public safety response needs have been receiving extraordinary attention and investment, which includes the development of our first and only nationwide public safety network, FirstNet. Now more than ever, first responders need to have their voices heard so thank you to all of you who are taking time to be with us today for our conversation with Commissioner Symington. And Commissioner, thank you and your staff for making this conversation possible. As we get started, Commissioner, I'm just gonna ask you to tell us a little bit about yourself, your background and how you became an FCC Commissioner. Thank you. Thank you very much, Martha. I'm happy to be here today and to have the opportunity to talk to the PSBTA. Um, I, this is an important relationship for me, and I'm looking forward to developing an ongoing relationship now that I'm uh, now that I'm on the FCC. Um, before I talk about myself, though, I'd like to talk just a little bit about my view of the importance of public safety. It's clear, I should think, given the uh, catastrophes confronting us increasingly frequently today, that public safety should be on the national front burner. There are major hurricanes, wildfires, the current polar vortex in Texas, and of course, the pandemic. So I'm looking forward to learning from the public safety community, and I hope to take the opportunity, especially once travel becomes more feasible, to visit major sites. I'd also like to put together a public safety roundtable, and I invite members of uh, all public safety organizations to uh, reach out to me on this front. Um, my, I, came to, um, I came to the United States originally from Canada, actually, and my background is rural Canadian. I'm from Saskatchewan, which is roughly north of Idaho and Montana. Um, so, in, uh, so in my family, there's extensive experience with the challenges of rural development and rural safety. I'm sure um, many of you know that farming, for example, is a particularly dangerous occupation. And so there's always had to be a lot of, uh, a lot of attention to safety, to self-help, and to maintaining an overall safe environment. Um, I, it's my view that when it comes to public safety, policymakers need to listen very carefully to the uh, experts on the ground who are encountering challenges to public safety every day. Sadly, the closest I've ever come is my lifeguard certification, so I can't claim to be a natural born member of the public safety community, but I'm hoping that I can make up for that but with constructive engagement with the public safety community and lots of proactive outreach to make sure that your voices are heard in my office and that I can help communicate your concerns to the commission. Uh, coming from a rural background, uh, it's I've got direct experience with the sheer scale of um, some of the more rural areas of North America. So there's there's a local joke, for example, in Saskatchewan that if your dog runs away, you can probably see him go for three days. Uh, it's big, it's flat, and we have roughly the same population density as the Sahara Desert. Um, however, in an increasingly urbanized nation, the sheer scale of the United States is increasingly unfamiliar to many Americans. Um, I've been speaking uh, with members of the public safety world and with representatives from rural states, and they're telling me that uh, the, there are many telecommunications applications that will add greatly to national safety if deployed in remote areas. 
Um, key examples include sensors instead of people to observe danger signs or sensors in places where people can't go or to do something boring like sit in a forest and wait for it to burn down. Likewise, remote sensing uh, offers great potential for improving safety with uh, electric transmission utilities. Um, as we've seen, uh, power lines can cause uh, can cause immense uh, harm when coming down, and yet the, these power uh, these power line fires can travel extremely quickly. So, very often, paying attention to the remote areas are how we prevent prevent severe damage to urban areas. So, one example of this, from my personal experience, or at least from that of people who are close to me. Uh, the biggest disaster close to home in northern Saskatchewan was the Fort McMurray wildfire of 2016. Uh, in my opinion, the Fort McMurray wildfire both shows successful disaster management and also represents opportunities to improve disaster management through improving telecommunications. So uh, Fort McMurray is a fairly sizable town uh, of, of over 80,000 people, but it's quite isolated and it's focused on uh, on working in the mining and petrochemical industry. The, the Fort McMurray fire was initially observed by a helicopter forestry crew. Uh, fortunately, a rapid response by public safety and including coordination with the military resulted in a timely evacuation of the town. In fact, I don't believe that there were any deaths whatsoever other than two people killed in a traffic accident on the way out. Nonetheless, it spread over a million and a half acres, about 2,300 square miles, and took over one year to be fully extinguished. It cost $10 billion, admittedly Canadian dollars, but it's, it's still, a, 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 still a hefty sum. And of course, it shut down a lot of um, industrial operations. So what we see in the disaster response was effective interagency coordination and many different types of telecom applications. As against that, I'm sure all of you are already thinking of ways that you could have used advanced applications to detect things earlier, to coordinate a response better, and in general, to fulfill the ongoing mission of improving public safety. So, um, but to, to turn to the personal case just a little bit, um, I've already spoken about growing up, um, growing up abroad, and I would say that uh, having the opportunity to serve on the commission really isn't only in America's story. Uh, I come from originally the, uh, well, actually, I come from the world of academia originally, then as, had a second career as a lawyer in uh, both uh, both private practice and corporate practice. Um, while I was doing this, I've noticed the immense uh, explosion of health and safety technologies that have accompanied the wider deployment of 4G in North America. So, for example, uh, there are now many cheap, complex medical devices that are capable of doing remote sensing that operate over 4G commercial networks. So, on, so I think this is a big success story. As commercial networks have gotten more capable, they've also uh, greatly increased all sorts of nuances of public safety. Um, I also noticed in my legal career the great difficulties of state and municipal finance working on bond deals in those areas and working on funding of uh, medical receivables in those areas. So I'm mindful of the state and municipal financing challenges that very often face public safety organizations. After that career, I worked at the NTIA, which is uh, one might say the sister agency to the FCC dealing with federal spectrum instead of with uh, commercial spectrum. Uh, and that gave me the, the opportunity to look at a number of applications that are mission critical and that are a little bit outside of my previous business career. So disaster response, weather monitoring, even military applications, those are within the NTIA's competencies. So again, I, this was an opportunity to learn about the public safety uh, community's uh, needs in telecommunication. Now, I've declared the intention to be an ally and advocate of the public safety community. So this leads to the question, how can people outside the public safety community understand its needs and make sure that public safety is centered in broad decisions that affect all of society? Well, I'm here to learn. And while I haven't come up through the public safety community, I do want to be an informed advocate and trusted friend. My view is that the FCC has an affirmative obligation to identify and engage with non-lobbyist organizations. Um, and I must say that by inviting me to today's panel, the public safety community has shrewdly seen that this is a good idea and opened the door for it to happen, for which I'm grateful. The FCC has to operate within DC. First of all, it's the law. But beyond that, DC is where many interests come together to be discussed and resolved. 
precisely for that reason, the FCC must look outside Washington, D.C., as we're doing today, to uh, learn from what people are doing all over the country and to learn what their concerns are. I'm happy to say that the FCC has had a number of successes in this area. I think we're all, we're all happy about the 988 line, which has recently come in. The FCC has uh, been focused recently on implementing the Z-axis roadmap um, as an example of its function coordinating uh, regulatory activity, stakeholders at the public safety level, and industry. Still, it's important for us to develop a 360-degree perspective on how our decisions will affect all stakeholders. An example of this was the T-band preservation. Uh, Congress had initially directed the T-band to be commercialized. Uh, Congress, in consultation with the public and with the FCC, removed this mandate and the FCC took down its order to commercialize the T-band. So this, I, I believe, is a good example of successful engagement across many sectors of society to get to the overall best result for the public. Um, and I think the road forward here is to continue engaging with the public safety community to proactively learn about their concerns and take them into account. Um, part of this as well is infrastructure awareness. We have to acquire a mindfulness of why institutions and practices exist and what we lose when they're weakened. Our society is just too complicated for any single person to understand it all. That's why uh, organizations such as the PSBTA are so important because they become the, the voice for the public safety community within the, the context of, of uh, certain kinds of regulatory and political decision-making in Washington. So just to recap, surely recent dis disasters with the polar vortex, floods, fires, and the pandemic demonstrate the importance of natural disaster response. Likewise, um, we're all aware of the challenges, or I hope we're aware, of confronting urban policing and firefighting. I also note that with rural policing, there's the potential for the extension of reach where more, uh, where more densely populated urban areas are on occasion able to enable drawdown on non-local tools. So one interesting example of this that I've seen in a related area is uh, certain telemedicine applications that we're seeing today um, in, which, uh, in which the most connected urban centers that have the most cutting edge research are in some cases able to provide services to other areas. Uh, including in some cases disadvantaged urban areas. So it's telemedicine in the sense of being two miles away, but it's also telemedicine in the sense of providing services into a community that otherwise wouldn't have access. I think there are exciting potential for telepolicing uses as well, um, with the potential to reduce contact, especially relevant during the pandemic. Uh, some examples that we're starting to see emerge are for scene reports in, in larceny cases, identity theft or crashes without injury, um, I believe there's significant potential for this to develop as we work together with the public safety community to enable them to have the tools they need. So that leads me to the question of uh, vision uh, as commissioner and, and how I see my engagement with the public safety community going. Of course, this isn't a closed book. I intend to keep listening and learning, but where I am right now is to focus on regulatory certainty. There's a high cost to uncertainty in money, time, and heartburn. For one thing, if you don't know what the rules are, you have to go to a lot of meetings instead of concentrating on emergency response. So I, I don't mean to joke about this too much, though. If there's uncertainty, then you don't know what equipment you're going to be able to get. You don't know what kind of training you're going to need, or at least there are enough error bars around those that it makes it very difficult to future-proof your plans. So instead, I think that what we should do is find what works and support it. Um, I'm uh, one example of uh, one example of a, di a difficulty with this uh, was the National Emergency Address Database, uh, which I think probably seemed like a good idea at the time. And at the time, no one had any idea that phones would get so good um, at onboard and operating system enabled uh, facilities for location accuracy. Nonetheless, they did. So uh, the community and the FCC turned around, and um, and we're now we're now going in a different direction. I think this is a positive development. We identify things that work. We don't uh, continue pouring resources into things that don't work, but we also establish certainty so that once something is committed to, it can be a long-term commitment. And as part of, an, as part of the overall idea here, we ha I have to be a liaison and advocate for public safety interests in Washington, DC, where all national interests come together for resolution. I think if I work with the public safety community, I'll be able to understand your needs for person-to-person -person and station-to-responder capabilities. That's the fundamental need. But beyond that, the public safety community's need for data or potential for using data will always be much bigger than just that. 
Many technologies that will be of use to the public safety community primarily live in commercial bands and will use advanced commercial grade gear and spectrum. And so distinguishing between these two, so that on the one hand, um, there's always spectrum available for urgent needs, but on the other hand, we're also looking at ways for the public safety community to deploy broader technologies and to ensure that there's uh, sufficient capacity for them um, to make uh, effective use of them, I think that's how we get to the overall best result. Um, I've, uh, I've been looking at trends in the ecosystem here. Um, I think I can point to some good and some bad. And let's start with the positive. There have been huge infrastructure invest investments in recent years, thanks to the auction model and the successful delivery of uh, major auctions by the uh, by the recently terminated or by the recently I shouldn't say terminated by the recently completed Pi Commission. There's been an immense amount of spectrum that's been commercialized and put to much higher utilization. This has le led to wide broadband availability and a, a progressive closing of the digital divide. We're not there yet, but we're better off than we were a few years ago. This, it's also led to greatly increased spectrum use. If we look at what spectrum use has been like over the past five or 10 years, it's a hockey stick. Um, spectrum uh, utilization on a megabyte basis is about, uh, megabyte per megahertz basis is about 42 times what it was in 2012 in some commercial bands. This is good. It enables new technologies, continued device improvement, and previously impossible apps, such as the on-device Z-axis technology I was just talking about. It also permits improving system integration. Now it's time to talk about the bad. When technology changes, you have people who are reliant on that technology and on training to use that technology and on applications that they've extended that technology to cover. Those get orphaned. And with vendor support declining, other uses of spectrum sought, you may find pressure to exit a band that you're actively using. Um, so we'll, I hope to talk about that during the panel, how to fix this and how to live with it and how to get to the overall mission results that are needed. The second thing I'd like to identify is bad. Local budget pressure magnifies pain when spectrum is shifted. Uh, one thing that I'd be interested in exploring is potential use of spectrum relocation fund yields um, for applications to a public safety spectrum. These funds are already available to be used to relocate federal agencies. Uh, this would be an ongoing conversation with Congress and I have no intention of telling Congress what to do, but I do know that Congress has generally shown a broad trend of allowing wider use of spectrum relocation fund uh, auction proceeds precisely to encourage federal agencies to take another look at their spectrum and decide what they need and what they can part with. Uh, my, my view is that it may be a question of opting to permit hundreds of millions of dollars in upgrade incentives in order to clear tens of billions of dollars worth of spectrum. To me, that's the definition of a win-win. And um, the, the AWS auction in 2006, which led to hundreds of federal agency upgrades, and the AWS 3 auction in 2014, which led to similar very large scale upgrades, uh, demonstrate how successful this model has been in the world of federal agency spectrum. Um, and with that, I, th I believe I'm done with my prepared remarks and I'm going to turn the conversation back over to the panel. Fantastic. Uh, thank you, Commissioner. We are clearly fortunate to have you in this role and deeply, deeply uh, appreciate your support. Uh, and by the way, as a lifeguard, you are definitely a member of the first responder community. So I'm officially letting you know that that, that, is, a, that is a thing. So, okay. So at this time, I would like to introduce our PSSA panel members. Joining us right now are retired Fire Chief Jeff Johnson, retired Police Chief Chris Moore, and Sue Swenson, who served as the Chairwoman of the First Net Authority Board. Uh, and I do always like to point out that although our panelists have all retired from their primary roles in public safety and communications, uh, their commitment is ongoing to the success and development of all aspects of first responder communications. It's uh, clearly unwavering. So panelists, thank you as well for your ongoing investment of subject matter expertise and time to these efforts. So at this time, I'm gonna turn it over to you, Chief Johnson, to lead us through our panel discussion with the commissioner. Thank you. Well, thank you, Martha. And Commissioner, thank you for an excellent open. I, I thought you did a great job of kind of painting a picture of why and what you think are priorities within public safety. And as it, let's just uh, pull that string a little further, right? If in, in your confirmation uh, announcement, we were very pleased to see that you mentioned uh, public safety and we appreciated it because it's, uh, you know, public safety has got plenty of challenges and public safety professionals in uh, mass tend to focus on what their primary job is and they miss a lot of this kind of higher level 
get 10 years ahead of it kind of thinking. So in that case, we're gonna need you to help us do that, right? So what are some of, uh, some of your specific objectives while you're a commissioner? And I caught the one and loved it about the Public Safety Roundtable, but I thought I'd give you an opportunity to speak to some of your priorities. Uh, well, th thank you very much, uh, Chief. So as far as, um, as, far as my priorities, um, I, I think you really hit the nail on the head by pointing out, um, by pointing out that our first responders and uh, other public safety professionals um, are focused uh, are focused very much on uh, public safety day to day and on the security of the public day to day. And I think it would be rather unfair to say, oh, P.S. In addition, you have to plan ten years of federal spectrum policy in a hit. Uh, you know, I mean, that's if if that's the case, that really means that we're falling down on our jobs in in D.C. So, yeah. Um, but that said, we we're going to plan poorly if we're not listening carefully to your needs and also helping you. Um, helping you to advocate for interests that maybe you didn't even know necessarily that you had because they're at the regulatory level. So mm -hmm. I'd like, love to see the public safety community establish a secure berth in the, in the spectrum system, the system of allocating wavelengths for systems where commercial spectrum and devices aren't the appropriate answer. So this mm -hmm. will, now on the other hand, the counter pressure to this is going to come from the very heavy utilization that will be expected in the case of any commercialization of current public safety spectrum. So there's always a tension. It requires a broad-based national and industrial consensus, in my view, about what the appropriate size and location of an allotment for uh, public safety should be. And then we can, once, once this is stabilized and we've established which spectrum, uh, which spectrum should really truly be reserved and should be inviolable, and on the other, what functionality can live perfectly adequate uh, to the needs of the public safety community, fully fulfilling them, but on commercial systems, then we can cease the churn, allow vendors to have predictability about delivering the goods and let them scale up their production and improve their models. So I see the future of this as systems that can live on a sliced commercial network versus those that use, uh, that need truly dedicated functionality. And in a lot of ways, in a lot of ways, this is just emerging with the improved network slicing of 5G. Um, mm -hmm. So that's again going to be something we all cope with in the future. So, Commissioner, I'm not going to I'm not I'm not going to go back far enough where we used horses to pull steamers, mm -hmm. but I will go back to the start of my career when uh, when public safety operated in the 42 megahertz band. So, state police was 4282. They had these big whip antennas, and they did that because they covered a lot of distance with that kind of lower spectrum right and then you know we ended up in vhf and then 700 800 and you know where do you see this going i mean part of it's driven by the need for data and data speeds part of it's uh, uh you know spectrum efficiency the efficient use of spectrum hence narrow banding etc kind of where, where do you see this all shaken out you know that's a, that's a really interesting question and it partly depends where other people are going techn technologically as well so um, now you mentioned those those gigantic whip antennas, and uh, there's always yeah. a trade-off between uh, between range and antenna size and data speed. And so um, and so I think uh, what we're seeing right now is um, within the world of commercial telecom, um, sort of three islands emerging: one in in the six to nine hundred, one in the two point five to three point five gigahertz range. And then uh, up in millimeter wave, those are those are sort of the the three blocks where uh, where the 5G spec tends to live most naturally. We'll we'll leave the conversation about whether lower band really is true 5G or not to one side. So I'd like to note that with uh, with 5G mid band, uh, so 2.5 to 3.5 gigahertz, that's where you get the incredibly high data performance with a pretty acceptable range. You get a much faster pipe than with 4G phones you get a much, much, much faster um, responsiveness, which is incredibly important if you're using any sort of automatically or remote operated tools. And, um, and what's more, the commercial networks are gonna go out there and build gigantic big fat pipes for that data. So, um, so, I, so that's, that's an area, I think, where, um, where public safety spectrum um, would really be well used by looking to commercial um, networks, which I want to reiterate, they're just packing in huge amounts of capacity here right now, um, in order to deploy applications that live sort of in that wavelength. I think you're right to identify lower bands as being uh, the bands that are most suitable to long-range communications, and that will continue uh, that will continue to be um, 
maybe for some of the more mission critical or remote applications. Um, but as far as as far as stuff that we would look at for next gen technology, I would say that that's 5G midband and above, and the uh -huh. app, the development uh, app, both application and um, and hardware development on those bands is going to just be out of this world. It's where everyone is putting all their resources. Thank you, Commissioner. Um, and oh. maybe just just one coda on that. I would, I would say that the, the public safety need for data is always just going to be much bigger than the public safety specific spectrum. And, and Chief Johnson's question really, I think, gets to the heart of that. Um, the, and I don't, I don't want to deprecate dedicated bands. Dedicated bands are always going to be important. Just a question of making choices about what those are. And I look forward to hearing from you folks, too, what your interests are and what those should be. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Fantastic. Good. Thank you. So Jeff, I think um, I think you've completed uh, your set of questions. So I'm going to move on, Commissioner. Thanks for joining us today. It's a pleasure to have you here, and uh, just appreciate your perspective and experience. And and clearly, you are a proponent of technology. So I'm delighted to hear that. Um, and as you're aware, technology has made some amazing advances, uh, and it seems like the pace of change is faster than ever. Um, and and probably aware that public safety is really engaged with technology, particularly with the introduction of FirstNet. I think the introduction of FirstNet, moving them from a voice-only capability in LMR to voice and data is, is making them aware of what's available to them. But wanted to get your view, and you've mentioned a couple of things, on what, you, what technology you think can contribute to a particular incident commander's um, effectiveness. You know, we've got enhanced location that was just introduced. Um, you know, we, we've talked about fires, particularly like we were talking earlier about the campfire, you know, alerting communities is critically important and of course enhanced coverage. So any thoughts you have on, you know, your view on what other kinds of technologies that you're aware of could en enhance a, an incident commander's uh, effectiveness? Um, that's a great question. And I'd, I'd like to, uh, again, point to an example that I've seen in the telemedicine world. So okay. um, a few weeks ago, I was at Children's Hospital in, um, in Washington, D.C. to observe their incredible uh, telemedicine center. And, um, and one, of the, one of the really remarkable things that they have is a, is a sort of a network center or, or command center in which uh, doctors who are running a case can, um, can see a huge amount of real-time information. So they'll, mm -hmm. they can see sonograms, they can see complete case histories, um, they have remote communication with, uh, with offices and, and clinics all over the place. And it's, uh, it reminded me sort of of the bridge of a, of a naval vessel or something yep. like that. There are right. probably you know, 30, 40 screens in the room. And, and, um, and, I, and, and so I was asking the question, well, how on earth do you possibly stay on top of all of that? I have, you know, I have trouble, enough trouble keeping up with my email. And right. the answer was that I guess they have really extensive um, artificial intelligence and machine learning technologies deployed on all this data so that, right. um, so that sources of trouble are constantly being identified and then brought to the doctor's attention for a decision. And it's not always, uh, it's not, it's, sometimes it's a false positive, sometimes uh -huh. you have to aware of the possibility of a false negative, but nonetheless, it serves as a data aggregator for many, uh, for many sensors and investigations that are going on, allowing for an executive, uh, executive decision to be made by a, a responsible doctor. So I see that as being the real payoff as we get much, much more data running over commercial grade networks and equipment. Um, right. The the challenge there the challenge there is making um, is 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 really making the data intelligible, uh -huh. and the conversations there with vendors are going to have to include uh, questions about uniform data formats and data formats that are optimized for aggregation and data mining. Right. But, but once you get there, the the uh, caliber of field intelligence is probably second to none. So um, as as far as the actual as far as the actual potential for individual devices. I feel mm -hmm. like the vendor diversity is so great. You know, yeah. there, you could combine, you know, you could, you could cover really the whole gamut and I could see a single department having uh -huh. old gunshot sensors on the one hand, fire uh -huh. detection sensors on the other hand, perhaps communication with other agencies to share data among these. I think the difficulty is, is less acquiring the data and just making sense of, out of it. 
I think you're spot on. I mean, we, I think we're seeing that already, uh, and certainly Chief Moore can talk about that from just the 911 and information that's coming into the call, you know, into their call centers and aggregating all of that. I think it's important. It's interesting when you talked about dedicated spectrum needed for public safety. You know, I think one of the great successes of FirstNet, as you know, having been at NTIA, is the fact that Band 14 is utilized uh, not only for public safety, but commercially as well. So I think that there's been a demonstration of being able to take that spectrum and make it available and dedicated to public safety while not letting it lay unused, you know, for commercial. So I think we have some precedent setting there as we look ahead for public safety, but appreciate your thoughts on technology and look at, frankly look forward to many more discussions because it's frankly one of my favorite topics next to public safety. So look forward to future discussions on that. Chief Moore, I think you might have a question for the commissioner. I do. Thank you, Sue. And thank you, Commissioner, for joining us today. And, and also thank you for your, your interest and support of public safety. It's very public. That's It's great to hear. Um, for far too many years, uh, I think, and, and with all due respect to the vendor community that, that have really tried to supply us with what they thought we needed, it was really important that public safety assert its voice to say what we really needed and to have the support of the FCC to help assist with that. And I think FirstNet was a great example of that, where public safety sat down and said, these are the types of things we need, and then everybody sort of rallied around that. So my question goes to more of, since you know, public safety does not have legions of lobbyists uh, to support their advocacy. Typically, it tends to be very grassroots. And you'll see that with our community, that people really like to engage. Uh, but a lot of times, they don't know how to. We're, we're very action-oriented people. Uh, we tend to respond to things right in front of us. But to, to Jeff's earlier point, your point about, hey, thinking the 10-year out scenario, those types of things, what is the best way in your mind for public safety to engage with you, with the FCC, to make sure that the needs, the frontline uh, responders have a voice in what is said. You've already mentioned some of the things you've talked about, and I appreciate that in your opening comments there about how important that is to you, but to sort of uh, make that systemic. And so the public safety, how, how is the best way for us to get and insert, you know, rather than a, 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 you have your process to be able to, to do the regulatory filings and, and the comments in there, that's great, that's really good, but is, are there better ways or are there different ways that public safety can engage in your mind? Uh, well, uh, thank you, Chief Moore. Um, I would say, uh, I would say, you know, you you've identified uh, yourselves as as people who take action. Um, inviting me to come here today is an example of taking action. That's uh, it's been very helpful. I've all, I feel that just the process of preparing for today has already been an education and helped me a lot. Um, I would, in a way, throw it back and say that there's a responsibility that rests with regulators to um, to go out and proactively engage with communities. That um, that tend to spend their time solving problems and not lobbying. Um, that said, that said, that's not an, an adequate answer um, for what the public safety community should do if regulators are not are not doing that. So um, I see two key practices as being um, as being at issue here. The first is that, um, and something I think the public safety community has done effectively, is to promote from within in policy. I feel like policy asks should come from experienced leaders. Um, mm -hmm. Then it it makes sense to it makes sense to figure out how to present those or how to figure or how to fit them into a bigger ecosystem or question. But I feel like the the request really should come from the ground up operational level and for people who've um, for people who've asked themselves in the field, you know, why don't I have this or what would I do if I had that? Um, if uh, I, I think it's, it would be a bad idea for this to become too um, domesticated, so to speak, uh, too much uh, something that speaks in the vocabulary of the federal government and not enough in the vocabulary of working public safety um, experts. The second thing I'd like to encourage the public safety community to keep doing is what I would call enlistment. Policymakers should routinely be approached, asked to engage, and taught how to partner effectively. So I hope that's what I'm in the process of doing today. And I think Sue, you'll have to you'll have to tell me if that reflects your experience, but I suspect that that's what your experience is like as well, of, of sort of being enlisted into this. Um, but on the other hand, it's kind of exciting. You get approached and you get told, well, you know, are you interested in making a difference? Are you interested in helping with public safety? Who can say no to that? Um, so uh, the aim of this should be, I think, to develop long-term relationships with specific regulators for two-way communication to make sure that uh, to make sure that you just got a, a base of people who will who will pick up the phone. Who will um, who will get you meetings that you need? Who will take the time with you to learn your issues? And if you do that, you'll have effective representation in DC. Thank you. I very much appreciate your outreach and your willingness to to take that on. I think it's going to go 
uh, a long way in, in our community to make sure that uh, the need, needs are identified and they're addressed in the best way possible. Recognizing, look, we don't always know what is possible and the art of the possible is changes from day to day. But I also recognize that we, we are tend to be hard nosed, we tend to push pretty hard, but we also are realists. Uh, as if there's one thing that we are good at is we can take a situation and pick it apart and make sure it's, it's that we can make it happen or we can't. And we appreciate that frank dialogue and we appreciate your presence today. Marcy, yeah. Good Chief Moore, I would just add one thing to that and say one thing, Commissioner, that we uh, 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 suffer from is nothing seems impossible to us. You know, people said that <laughs> it was impossible. We didn't believe that. And that's, uh, you know, that's part of the, you know, part of it is the attitude is looking at what we think is possible. And, uh, you know, you have a saying, if someone didn't die, anything could be fixed. So, um, that's, right. and that's kind of our view on that. So uh, appreciate your perspective on that. And you can be assured that we'll be working with you and your staff and the other commissioners uh, as well. Yeah, uh, thank you, Sue, and thank you, Chris, uh, for your questions. And thank Commissioner, you. you have it spot on. Uh, you know, the, the upside of public safety is they, you know, they don't quit. That's great news when you and your family need public safety. Uh, when you're on the regulatory side or the implementation side, so sometimes we don't go away when we should. But, you know, we're pure of heart. <laughs> <laughs> There's nothing in it for us. So, you, you know, we, we try to be good about that. You mentioned something, too, that caught my attention. I thought it was fascinating. Before I turn it over to uh, Martha, there's this whole whole evolution of technology going on in public safety, and, and you mentioned the ability to do shot spotting in communities. And, you know, typically those tend to be fixed facility-based. But once you open up this conversation about what are the best ways to do it, it takes nothing to get to a place where you imagine every police officer on the street that has the equivalent of a shot spotting app on the phone, and you turn triangulation into 500 or 200 listening devices that increase the preciseness. And it literally would be able to give you the Z axis, et cetera, et cetera, if you get enough devices listening. And, and if you take the case of Las Vegas, that's a game changer to get that instantly and have that occur in a meshed relationship between the police officers listening devices. I, I, I think that the whole notion of that is, is to discuss what the art of the possible is, to engage public safety and blend minds like yours and Sue Swenson's and people that do this for a living and, and share the challenges and the vision. So I really appreciated you bringing that up. It's my responsibility to turn this over to Martha Ellis. Thank you. <laughs> well, thank you. I loved the panel discussion. That was fantastic. And, and one of the last things that we were just talking about was that connection between the first responder community and uh, representation in DC. And, and Commissioner, you did mention clearly that you are a public safety advocate. So I'm, I'm kind of curious who, uh, beyond maybe the scope of the FCC, who else is your audience uh, as far as advocating for public safety? Yeah, um, absolutely. Uh, audience and, and I have to say um, partners as well, because uh, the, the whole point of advocacy is to, um, is to try to move, uh, is to try to move uh, society as a whole in a particular direction or the, you know the portion of society that's responsible for something in a particular direction. So I, so I would, I would say partners, and I wouldn't, I wouldn't hold myself out yet as anyone with any uh, particular concrete uh, uh, record of advocacy. That's something I would want to build rather than something I think I could lay claim to today. Um, and I also want to want to point to a past history of, of um, advocacy at the FCC that has led to some successes. But when as to the question of who is the audience, who is, um, who is the target? I think I think the answer is very often. Um, I think the, the the answer is very often uh, the commercial community on the one hand who needs to know um, who needs to know what uh, interests they might be impinging upon with actions that they want to take and what kinds of compromises might need to be made or could be acceptable to make and in general I found the commercial community is pretty responsive um, they just they they just need communication and the second thing I would say is uh, the legislator uh, the legislators I mean as a you know, as a regulator, I always have to make you know just 100% crystal clear. I don't have uh, I don't have any power or authority. The FCC has no power or authority beyond what was given to it um, or what was delegated to it by Congress in its statute. And uh -huh. so um, and so Congress uh, Congress can and has 
uh, changed statutes uh, from top to bottom and just given us uh, new responsibilities and uh, and new accountability. And so I would say uh, there's always a question of, of at what level should this live? And it's not something that might ever be apparent to someone who's outside of government work of this type. So mm -hmm. um, the audience really should be everyone who is involved with, um, for example, with a spectrum issue, every potential stakeholder there. Um, and then as far as who to move, then the answer, the answer is again, anyone who has a potential interest and who might oppose that change. My sense is that people are pretty reasonable um, if you can get the points in front of them and lay them out. So it's just, just a matter of keeping the communication open. There's not necessarily a magic bullet. It's just um, much like I think what our, our public safety people are experiencing. It's just a matter of grinding it out day in, day, in, day out, trying to get it right on a uh -huh. daily basis. Um, you know, it never really goes away. Great, thank you so much. So in speaking to that five, 10 year forecast, potentially 15, 20 decades beyond uh, when any of us are even gonna be engaged in these endeavors, um, you, you talked about uh, some of the trends. Can, can you expand on your thoughts on, on the trends that you're seeing in developing a deep and healthy ecosystem, something that's gonna be sustainable long beyond us? Yes, absolutely. So, um, so I've spoken to America's immense hunger for um, for network capacity, uh, and I, I, again, I just just want to emphasize that commercial use of, of of wireless communications is up so sharply that it's it's really mind boggling. Mm -hmm. um, I don't I don't think we've hit saturation. I don't think we'll hit it for some time. And with five G, I expect also that many commercial users will be moving into that space with increased demand. When we talk about um, uh, when we talk about 5G business to business cases or um, or business to government cases, we're very often uh, looking at applications that just weren't possible up until this point. Um, and I'm saying 5G kind of as an umbrella term because there are a number of mid-band technologies that are not over 5G networks, but that um, are making similar plays uh, for distance and latency. Um, so to so to pick examples, um, so to pick examples of the kind of thing that we're talking about. Um, we now have uh, we now have such highly developed um, Internet of Things uh, connectivity and capability in industrial and agricultural and logistical operations that we can uh, we can track individual components. We can even have individual components periodically phoning home on a network to assure everyone that they're okay. Um, mm -hmm. There are intervehicle um, applications in mid-band that can be used for um, increasingly automatic traffic detection or automatic intervehicular uh, vehicular communication. Uh, we're now seeing, for example, sensor suites that can sit within um, a crane at a port, and that can um, that can report uh, the health and the and the motion of the components within the crane arm and uh, other mechanical uh, parts of the crane in order to um, in order to in order to connect to the, all aspects of a network, tracking a single container and see where that container is, is shipped, make sure uh, where it sits. To um, to look at uh, to to look at ways of automatically improving the workflow over time. So America's hunger for data is just immense, and um, and this is going to continue to have applications in public safety. So you know, for example, we were talking uh, we were talking about the ability uh, pot potentially to deploy shot spotters on yeah. individual police officers and network those. Um, I mean, that's obviously one capacity. Uh, we're when we look at AI and machine learning developments, there's spectral there's spectrum components to these. Terrestrial drone and satellite systems are key parts of early wildfire detection. Um, AI and machine learning can flag danger signs for human review. Um, and again, this in, this touches a, a number of bands. Uh, drone systems are typically 5030 to 5091. Uh, FCC OET, uh, sorry, Office of Engineering and Technology is also suggesting a reexamination of a lower band here. Um, we're starting to see applications uh, for vehicular sensors to wirelessly send crash notifications to EMTs and other first responders, in some cases uh, with an initial sit rep and even injury predictions. Um, still another one is aggregation of public safety camera data for automatic review and flagging uh, via machine learning. Um, if we can, for example, track a, track a vehicle automatically that's fleeing a scene um, using, existing, uh, using existing cameras, uh, and uh, and save people the hassle of pouring through that data manually to stitch it together. But again, data volumes are very high on this. 1080 feeds produce much better results than 480 feeds. So as far as where this points, I would say the public safety community spectrum interest is partly in reserve spectrum, but also 
partly in promoting development of commercial spectrum and finding applications that live on commercial spectrum. I myself suspect that industrial applications and safety applications are going to become much, much more prominent in commercial spectrum than they were in the 4G era. Uh -huh. So it so, sounds like with all of, oh, sorry, go ahead. Does somebody have no, something? Sorry, just to, to go on that point of, uh, to further that point, uh, a, a lot of new data coming in in the public safety space, and you think about our, our 911 centers, where you have uh, lots and lots of information coming in with a relatively uh, small number of people, highly qualified people that have to take a lot of data and get it out in the street. Your use and talk of uh, talk of the use of AI is really, really critical because there's some great data that can come in. But if we overload our people, uh, I think it's really important to include to make sure we have the, the, the spectrum part of that, but also the technology pieces in order for our people who are going to receive this information, get it in a form that can be digested and put out to the field in, in a timely fashion. Uh, so I appreciate that your, your insight on that. So, Commissioner, I, I want to append your uh, answer just a bit and acknowledge how insightful I think timely it is. So you raise the issue in the crash notification. We get those in public safety today. Uh, the overwhelming majority of those come in through the 10 digit front end number that's connected by lat lawn, right? And then you get this notification saying, you know, one of our customers is involved in a crash at such and such an address. But the fact is the vehicle knows how fast that vehicle was going how many G-forces it exerted upon crash, how many occupants it has, whether it's running on its side, on its top. And that completely changes how one of us would react to that emergency. If there's eight people in a suburban that wreck at 85 miles an hour, uh, that's a very different response than rush hour bump into bumper cars on the freeway. And the, the efficiency comes from being extremely well informed so that we can send what needs to be sent. And it's on time when it needs to be there. So I, I think it's really critical to connect all the pieces. It isn't just about data. It isn't just about voice. It, it, it's about putting the pieces together now that we have the pieces and creating the opportunity for uh, innovation and the kind of reliability that public safety needs. So I really appreciated your thoughts. Mm -hmm. oh, sure. Thank you. Yeah, fantastic uh, comments from all of our panel members. I really appreciate that. Now, earlier in your discussion, Commissioner, you brought up the uh, concept of orphaned technology. Can you talk a little bit about how the FCC can address issues regarding orphan technology in the public safety space? Uh, yes, thank you, Martha. Uh, orphan technology is, of course, um, is, is of course it's inevitable, right? I mean, there we all own, um, or we've all owned computers that uh, that they just don't make parts for anymore, or cell phones that won't get on any modern network. And um, and as against that, with a with a technology that has a public safety application, there's always a reliance interest. You know, if my if my uh, if the network deprecates my 2G phone and it can't go anywhere anymore, I can always go buy a new phone. And if I don't have a phone for a day, a day or two while I'm busy doing that, well, you know, no big loss. But on the other hand, if a public safety system goes off offline for the time it takes to run a procurement cycle, um, mm -hmm. assuming there's money available to do it even, then, um, then you've got a problem. So there's always a question of how to transition technologies effectively. Mm -hmm. um, earlier, I mentioned strains on state and local budgets. And I think that's something that you've got to talk about when you're talking about orphan technology. Because I don't know that there really is such a thing as a technology that um, that is orphaned when it when it still has a viable place in the uh, in the new equipment or even in the maintained equipment market. But I, I, orphan technology is probably technology that is um, that is reaching um, the the back end of its of its useful life. And just because we're getting current use out of it doesn't mean that the market in some ways hasn't moved on and the vendors haven't moved on. So there's the question of how do we bridge this gap? We're getting current use out of it. Nonetheless, applications in the in the country overall are in decline, and there's less support in society for that technology. And then very often there's no money to fund new technology acquisition. Mm -hmm. So um, so so it becomes a, a problem that's maybe partly technical, but it's really more social and touching on different aspects of of the economy and of society. Um, if uh, if we look at a, a case study, I mentioned the AWS One auction. Um, this was a, a relatively early Spectrum auction. Um, Spectrum auctions were first tried in I want to say '95. I'm dating myself a little bit. I'd have to go back and look. 
but mm -hmm. uh, the AWS auction was a very successful one um, because there was a conscious effort to connect uh, spectrum relocation um, expenses with the revenues that came in. And the, the, a, a huge number of federal agencies were caught up in this, and it led in many cases to technologies that were uh, 40 or more years out of date being replaced. So the agencies uh, generally very high satisfaction because these technologies that were brought in were more secure. They used lower power. They were much cheaper to maintain because parts were available instead of having to be in some cases custom made. And they were often actually safer for the operators as well. You know, they had they had um, more up to date shielding. You know, they were more compliant with uh, with modern uh, interface standards, whatever it might have been. So they were so these were very very widely deployed on federal lands and through a wide variety of federal agencies. So that's one answer of how to get past the budget crunch. Instead of um, instead of having to make the adjustment at the budgetary level, you recognize that the changes you're making to the spectrum regime are going to unseat reliance interests and cause people who are dependent on orphan technologies to take a big hit. And so you just compensate them. You say, hey, we're getting so much money out of this auction. There's so mm -hmm. much commercial desire for the uh, for the spectrum that it makes sense to to pay people who have reliance interests and just say, you know. You've dealt with this long enough. Go upgrade your equipment. We'll, you know, you don't care about the band, you care about the equipment and the functionality. So we'll just give you something new. And um, this is an option that is generally not as available at the state and local level. And I think it produces a lot of hassle. And very often the amounts that are coming in are rather small in comparison to auction proceeds. So to, so to pick a big example, the C band auction just uh, just wrapped up, and the total proceeds from that are well over eighty billion dollars with a B. So um, I'm now now obviously um, obviously not not every auction is going to be like that. Uh, there are certain market market conditions that led to that. Um, but, uh, and, and there's certain qualities of the spectrum and all the rest. But the point I'm trying to make here is that, um, the point I'm trying to make here is I think very often it, there will be some kind of a financial incentive, um, that can be, that can be discussed if there's going to be a significant reliance interest impacted. And that, I think that's the real way you deal with orphan technologies. It's orphan for a reason, right? If it's 50 years old, let's let's scrap it. Let's get something with current interface, current functionality, all the rest. And um, and if someone is making you scrap it, well, then that that just seems like a basis for compensation. Uh -huh. Great, thank you. Uh, so looking at the public safety community and our relationship to technology, are there any particular issues that you think that the public safety community should be watching to make sure that they have a stake in uh, future technologies? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so uh, I've already talked just a little bit about AI and machine learning, about the development of command centers, and about the integration of uh, information across um, a wide variety of domains. So um, I think that's exactly on point. Um, as that that uh, what we what we've heard from the chiefs already that there's um, that there is a lot of potential in those areas, and that should be a place the public safety community should be watching. Um, I would say that by watching that space, the public safety community is um, is committing to watching certain commercial spaces and to maybe. Um, and there should there should maybe I'm not saying that there hasn't been thought given to this, but there should be continuous thought given to proactive engagement with the commercial space over opportunities there, um, mm -hmm. because uh, very often there will be a toolkit that is being developed and that has a public safety potential application, um, but the developer might not know about it. So as far as otherwise ensuring that there's a stake in future technologies, I've talked about identifying bands that need to be dedicated to public safety applications and about identifying, on the other hand, um, applications that would live best off of public safety spectrum. Mm -hmm. So just again, to pick an example here, if we are doing, um, if we're doing generalized analyses of, um, of data off of commercial grade uh, webcams, and we're stitching together a picture of, of a situation based on that, uh, that by its nature is gonna be something that doesn't live in public safety spectrum and you wouldn't want it there. If you have it there, it's congesting your radio operations or something. You want that living on Wi-Fi spectrum or whatever the camera's native standard may be. Um, so I, I guess identifying the directions that you that you want to go, identifying future functionality that you that you would like to see, developing a wish list, going out and communicating it, and then making sure that you preserve your core interests um, 
while identifying uh, where those interests, uh, while other interests would be better served um, in uh, in a different spectrum or on commercial grade equipment. I think you put those together and that's how you make sure you have a stake in the future. You know, I would just like to comment, Martha, if I could. I think uh, sure. one of the things that we learned with FirstNet uh, that I think is important for the future is that because it was a nationwide network, um, you know, there was a lot of interest in coming in because the vendors were willing to commit, uh, to your point, Commissioner, to meet with public safety, understand what they were looking for, and then commit to developing. And so I think, you know, I think that's an important aspect that I think we have to look at in the future as we look at enhancement to technology that if there is a if there's a market there, which we've shown, I guess there's what, almost 300 devices now on band 14, you know, certified, I think that demonstrates that it's uh, significant enough for those people to bring the innovation and to listen to public safety. If it's if it's fragmented, then I don't think there's as much interest for, for obvious reasons. You and I wouldn't invest in a company that, you know, had a small little market. So I think that's going to be important going forward that whatever public safety is involved in, that it, that it see it, that kind of opportunity. And I think it got demonstrated through FirstNet. Sue, that's a huge point, and I, I think that's exactly why um, we want to distinguish between core and peripheral spectrum interests. Because yeah. the more clearly we clear, the more clearly we assert which ones are the core interests, the more likely we're going to have a long, long-lived vendor ecosystem in there. Correct. Correct. And, and Commissioner, along those lines, also your your priority for regulatory certainty is really important because the market can't respond, nor can public safety uh, make investment decisions unless we know what the what the playing field looks like. So appreciate that. Yeah. yeah. And we are certain, certainly comfortable, Commissioner, stranding certain technologies. I, I mean, we, we don't want to waste money at all, but my, no one asked me before my start, smartphone stranded my clock radio, my you know, calendar, my Thomas guide. <laughs> and, you know, public safety, we've, we've got, we're a little guilty of being behind the curve, Commissioner, and, and with our technologies and, and you know, we tend to be tradition-bound organizations. We have to pull ourselves forward technologically. Uh -huh. So we appreciate the fact that you're sensitive to wasting money. We don't want to do that. At the same time, we do need to be incented and pulled forward. Uh -huh. uh, well, Chief Johnson, I don't think you should do too big a mea culpa on that one um, because, uh, because <laughs> like, like I said, uh, first of all, the degree of certainty that you need and the degree of comfort that your operators need with a piece of equipment is not the same as in the commercial world. And uh -huh. you, you see the same thing in the military. I mean, um, I'm, I'm told that uh, I'm told that there are still particular military computers that use uh, use floppy disks. You know. <laughs> really floppy ones, the five and a quarter inch floppies. Um, and, that, and that's because uh, that particular application has been tested a billion times and they know it will work under all sorts of adverse circumstances. And rather than going looking for bugs in a new system, it's more efficient for them to just order a big crate of floppy disks and, you know, I guess use another one when they need to. And I, I, I'm not going to, I'm not going to prejudge when it's an appropriate time for public safety to um, to superannuate equipment or or to um, on the other hand tear it up and, and get something new. I guess my concern is I'm a, I'm also aware that there's very often a funding constraint on the upgrade path, and that mm -hmm. if um, if the regulators, Congress, and the public safety community could work together to find a way around some of those financial constraints on state and local government, some of which are going to be real real bad after the pandemic wraps up and they're not so good right now, yeah. then um, then that could um, that could help the decision to be made at the public safety level whether this is a technology that's tried and true and they want to keep or whether it's a, a dog that they have to hang on to because they can't afford an upgrade cycle. Yeah, Chief Johnson, you know, one of the things you and I have always talked about is, you know, in the commercial world, it's, um, you know, it's nice if it works, but it's not life dependent. I think in the right. public safety world, public safety has to know it's going to work um, yeah. before we're going to go to it because it is life and death uh, situation. So I think that's part of the reason why you see, you know, a little bit of hesitancy. And as we saw that in, you know, push to talk, be, I mean, the public safety community wanted to make sure that it was mission critical uh, because it was mission critical. So I think that's part of the reason that I think they're seeing that they are getting uh, technologies that are working for them in situations where they wouldn't before. And then that will encourage other uh, other advances in technology. But it's, I think it's very understandable about the uh, the uh, hesitation to move quickly. 
Well, as you say, public safety won't use something that sometimes works. Correct. Right? Right. <laughs> Thank you, Commissioner. <laughs> Thank you. All right, well, we are closing in on the top of the hour. So at this time, I would like to thank everybody uh, that has joined us today. We truly hope that you feel like your time was well spent and definitely a heartfelt thanks to the commissioner and our panelists. I would deeply appreciate every participation. Again, we are the Public Safety Broadband Technology Association and we really want to be your advocate for all aspects of broadband utilization. And by being here today, you really help support our efforts by, to continually bring you this cutting edge information about all aspects of broadband use for first responders, as well as the ecosystem that is being purpose-built to your advantage. <laughs> if you'd like to visit our webpage, you can find us at thepsbta.org. There you will find more information about the association, upcoming webinars, and recordings of all of our previous webinars. Uh, in appreciation for your attendance today, you will receive a free membership to the association for 2021. Uh, a discount code will be included in a follow-up email, which you can use during checkout when you register. And then finally, also consider visiting All Things FirstNet as well. Their team continually compiles valuable information on FirstNet and the developing ecosystem. This concludes our discussion with FCC Commissioner Symington and our incredible panel. And thank you all for your time and we'll see you on the next one. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. Thank you.